So my name is Roger Savory, and I'm the founder of Savory Holistics um, and the Deserts to Grasslands Feeding the Future X Prize team, which was the origin of this project and what I'm about. I went to fancy private schools in Africa. I went to called Wallace and Michael House, and um, I was the bush kid. Um, because it was a fancy private school, everyone else became lawyers, accountants, insurance agents, and bankers. But there had to be the one child who was the bush child. So I've always been you know, into natural history, wildlife, animals. Um, and so all my holidays were spent in the bush and being observant. So I would say I came through it through osmosis. And then with my father, with what he was doing uh, on school holidays, traveling to ranches and in the Chihuahuan Desert in Mexico or New Mexico or Utah or wherever we traveled or the Karoo Desert or the Namib Desert. Um, yeah, I've kind of always been seeing the expansion of the deserts. And then when I was in college, um, amongst the things I studied, I also studied desert field biology in college. So it's kind of, yeah, I think I'm born into it is the best way to describe it. Part of going to Anglican schools is we were forced to read the Bible. And in the Bible, I realized, hold on, these deserts have been around and been spreading for about 4,000 years, as far as the Bible was concerned. And while I wasn't a religious child, I understood the importance of what I was reading, as in, this is a problem that humans have failed to solve for 4,000 years. Um, a lot of people don't realize it, but I'm technically a high-functioning autistic. And so if you give an autistic person a mathematical problem to solve, we have to solve it. Well, this is a problem that I've spent 40 years solving. It's, it's been quite a struggle because it wasn't just mathematical. We had to solve the human element. I had to study humans and how they communicate. So you know, one of the things I studied in college was human communication. Then um, I also studied all the earth sciences, you know, uh, geography, geology, satellite imagery. And then I also studied all the, you know, the botany and the biology and desert field biology. So I had to study all the different sciences because I had, I realized that humans were connected to finance, were connected to the environment and we were inseparable. Um, so it wasn't just one field of study. I had to study numerous things. Basically, I had to study the whole and how this whole functions to understand the parts. Um, so it's been a lot more in-depth study than most, most of my academic peers. We haven't succeeded in reversing and changing it, but part of my study has made me realize what the real issue was. Um, and so from the human point of view, the real issue is that humans all, humans have uh, what I call instinctual fear. And so instinctual fear, what I've realized is it takes us three generations to overcome it. And so if you look at all the paradigm shifting ideas on the planet, they all from first discovery to implementation were at least 90 years minimum. And that's, that's this instinctual fear trigger. So that's the one aspect. Then there's the, uh, how, uh, e economics is, is triggered or offset by instinctual fear. And then I also have to figure out the whole environmental aspect. And one of the, uh, I'm very observant of nature. Um, and I think two things really triggered in my mind that were different to what everyone else was thinking. One was that we couldn't have any success without understanding uh, mushrooms and mycelial networks and that they are the real powerhouse of the globe. Um, and then the second point was when I realized that was realizing that ultraviolet light is what once land has turned to desert, why we've never been able to get it to recover because ultraviolet light sterilizes um, bacteria. We use it to sterilize bottled water, for example. So without finding a mechanism to prevent UV light getting to the soil, we had no hope. And then once we've solved the ultraviolet light issue, then the mushrooms, the mycelium can start their job. And when they're able to do their job, then plants can do their job. So it, you know, I, there was a lot that I had to put together. And I mean, some of the experiments I ran, I ran for about 13 years before I could get consistently positive results. Um, and that's 13 years waiting for mother nature. Okay realizing you made an error, adjusting, you know, replan, 
as I you know say all the time, you know, plan, monitor, control, replan. Um, and then um, so much of my training was in science, and I'm going to sound like a um, I'm going to sound like a, a heretic for saying this, but I'm a scientist who now doesn't believe in science. Um, I've realized that the scientific method can never understand our holes function. And if we never understand how holes function, and we use linear scientific thinking to try to solve a whole problem, we will always have unintended consequences and collapse and failure. So, um, so that's the one part of it. And then the second part of it is we're all praying at the God of, at the feet of the God of technology for solutions. And technology, by its very definition, is very linear. And so linear um, solutions can never solve holistic problems. And planetary collapse is a holistic problem. Everything is in, interconnected. So it's been a very disjointed learning journey to get to where I'm at. We've seen success over the last 35 um, years, basically wherever we've used this, this what, what is called holistic management. And it's really simple. It sounds really complicated. What does that mean? But it really comes down to how do humans want their lives to be socially, economically, and environmentally? And if we just say that, we call that a holistic context, once we've said the quality of life we desire, well, now we have a goal towards which we can make our decisions. Will that quality of life that we've said we want, if we make this decision, will it take us towards that or away from that? If it takes us away from that, don't make that decision. Try something different. For example, I've worked in deserts for you know, many years, and I've never heard someone living in a desert saying, I want to live in a desert. It's never happened. They always say, oh, I'd love to see grass, and I'd love to see trees, and I'd love to see rivers. So how is it that humans, one decision at a time, turn two-thirds of our planet into a desert? One decision at a time. We cut down the tree, we burnt it, what, because we never thought about what was the, what will the long-term consequence of that decision be, to, to be. So now, if we say we want green grassland and healthy soils and and you know, good economy and happy families and flowing water and clean air. I have a choice. I can pour gasoline on the ground and burn something, or I can say, well, no, actually that will pollute the ground, it'll pollute the water, it'll pollute the air. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Okay, let me recycle the gasoline or whatever it is. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking of silly examples, but it just makes us rethink every decision. So that's that's the key. And then when I looked at the deserts, I came up with a financial model for how we could get biocarpeting, um, and you need a mathematical starting point. So Elon Musk threw down the gauntlet with the Carbon X Prize, and and he said one gigaton of carbon a year. And when he was announcing the prize, he laughed and I laughed. Well, we both have the same. Um, way of thinking as in high functioning autistics he was laughing and i was laughing because we both knew it's mathematically impossible to measure a gigaton of carbon sequestration there's not enough energy on the planet to burn off the soil or whatever to measure the carbon so it was an inside joke you know amongst mathematical people but for everyone else it was a nice sound bite one gigaton of, ton of carbon but I use that and I use the civil engineering principle of plan backwards. So if you want the dam built by this day, you plan when you're going to get the concrete, when you're going to put in the rebar, when you're going to clear the ground, and you plan backwards. So I started at one gigaton and I said, okay, that's the goal. Now let's plan backwards. And when I did the reverse planning, I found that with only 600,000 cattle, or NEETs, um, as I prefer to call them, with only 600,000 NEETs, we could heal 150,000 acres of desert per year with biological carpeting. And over the next three years, that would get to a point of sequestering a gigaton of carbon. So this goal that people of humanity have said, well, can we get rid of a gigaton a year? I'm like, yes, we can. And oh, by the way, it's relatively easy. The land, the carbon sequestration, the carbon money from selling carbon credits will be a huge source of income. The 
red grass finished healthy organic meat that you could sell from as a byproduct is a huge source of food for the schools in the mega cities like LA and stuff. So there's the profitability of the meat business because you're turning grass into meat that is worth a lot more as a you know as a healthy you know uh, protein source. And if it's private land, it goes from valueless desert to extremely valuable farming country or ranchettes or whatever. And if it's government land, um, you know, the government can then decide whether it's going to go back to the Homestead Act and settle people because people forget there's 81 million acres of undeveloped desert in America and it's spreading, it's getting bigger. There's another 200 million acres at risk of turning to desert. So this is not a good situation. We have to solve this problem. And I've said, look, here's a financial model. We can actually do this and make money and do good. And more importantly, we actually don't have an option. We have to do it. So, you know, the, the starting point that, I, that we need to start is in, in my terms, because my pockets are empty, it's a lot of money. It's $100 million. But in a national economy, to get a project started for only $100 million, that can potentially completely change the world and solve all these problems that you know, tech companies give $2.4 billion to, to lab meat, which mathematically, as soon as I saw the lab meat, I was like, mathematically, that's impossible for the simple reason, what's the glucose source to grow the lab meat? Well, that's got to come from land. Um, and from photosynthesis. So, so the technology solutions that people are looking at are unrealistic. They mathematically can't pencil out. But there's a totally viable natural system that does work and can work. Um, so I'm trying to get knowledge out to the world that there's something we can do. It's relatively easy. You know, it's not you know, it's rocket science, but it's very complex. Um, but as a complex system, we've been playing with this for about 30 years now, and I think we've figured out all the pieces of the puzzle. Now we just need to put the puzzle together, and the final bit is financing, and let's do it. Um, and the, the first place to start, I believe, should be California, but it can work in Salt Lake, in Texas, in New Mexico, in Arizona. You know, it can work in any of our real deserts.